Hey everybody, I'm Joe Deganzik and this is Smarter Home Life. If you um, are new to Smarter Home Life, and we have a lot of new people who have come in, uh, I do these monthly Q&As and uh, one usually covers uh, all of the home automation topics and one usually covers LED lighting. Sometimes there's a little bit of crossover and they're just covered from uh, the comments that are generated and the questions and so forth that come into the email, uh, which is questions at smarterhomelife.com. That's the easiest way so that I can answer those. Um, they go into a dedicated inbox. It's easier to, uh, YouTube makes it incredibly difficult to manage comments. Don't know why, but anyhow, it's not your problem. Um, so I try to get back to you every couple days um, and then the best, most interesting ones go on these shows. Um, so there is uh, that, that's kind of how the thing works. These are longer episodes. Our core audience is tuned into these. And um, so I also have a special message that con that'll come up at the very end of the episode. It'll actually, it'll actually link to another episode about supporting the show, uh, which is more important now than ever. Let's see, speaking of support, um, our Patreon people, uh, definitely help to make the show possible. Thank you to people, um, to even like brand new supporters like uh, Clay W and uh, Steve B, uh, <laughs> Steve B, Steve R. We have so many first names that are duplicates and uh, Sean and Jim J and uh, Ray K and, and numerous others who, uh, who help us out every single month. So what is it for October that stood out the most? Well, instead of a bunch of questions, it's one kind of theme, one kind of topic which is, I just bought this thing, which the sales pitch was that it could connect all these different things and I could use my voice to control them all, but I have to do things one at a time, or I have to hook this thing to that thing and relay it from over here to over there, and then that doesn't work or it goes into a loop, and I'm really frustrated. Well, welcome to the modern world of home automation. Um, and I say that a little jokingly because, and you're going to find this amusing, my next statement here, but most of the modern world of home automation basically sucks. <laughs> and I know that one of the comments on one of the Q&A videos said, you're so good at just being truthful and honest about stuff. If you don't like it, you'll say so. That's right. Um, some of the stuff in, the, in this new world of home automation that's kind of blossomed in the past five to six years just sucks. It's not very good. Or it is very good at what it does, but it doesn't connect very well to other stuff. And I think everyone is finding that out now. Uh, I've been kind of saying that and dancing around that topic for the past two and a half years that I've been making these videos. And we see it in devices like, you know, the Echo Dot, you know, the smaller, uh, this is not the second generation that just came out, this is the first one that is now a collector's item because they're not making this one anymore. Uh, you know, any version of the Echo or Alexa enabled devices. And of course the brand new Google Home also has some challenges in it, even though they're both great devices. They're not really home automation devices, they're assistants at this point. And the question I think that's being posed by many people is when are they going to do all this magical home automation? Well, not until Google and Amazon get things right and actually enable you to um, use your voice to trigger off a list of things instead of one thing at a time. Um, now granted, there's at least with the Amazon Echo, which is, has, has a couple more years on it than the Google Home, which just came out last week. Um, <clears throat> there's probably some other skills that you can find and so forth, but I think most consumers don't want to dig that far. They want to buy this thing. They want to have native functionality. They're getting um, app, oh, there, there it was, app fatigue. I was trying to think of that word a, a couple hours ago when I was prepping for this episode. They're getting app fatigue. They're getting um, tired of having to download all of these extras to make things work. Um, and the one solution, and I don't, I, I know that uh, we get a wide variety of people um, on the show who come from multiple backgrounds, and I mean uh, operating systems and platforms, and whether it's Android or iOS, um, it doesn't really matter to me. But uh, this thing, the iPhone and iOS devices, are the, f this iOS is the first major operating system to have home automation built in, right? You can take um, a HomeKit compatible device 
that doesn't require a hub. And I don't have it in my hand, unfortunately. Um, like the iDevices, you can hook it up to this and you're done. No hub required, it's simple. And HomeKit, which you can operate with or without Siri because Apple built the Home app and there's obviously every, uh, every app maker or every manufacturer has their own little app. Um, but you can actually trigger things and uh, based on time or just or just telling it, hey, I want this scene to fire right now and press a button and it'll fire off a bunch of different things, which is completely different from say, IFTTT. And I had emails from you guys about that too, saying, I, why is it this has to do one at a time? Which was my thought exactly when I started playing around with IFTTT a few years ago. It's if this, then that. But why isn't it if this, then a few other things? It would make sense that you should be able to say, hey, if this, like if you detect an email or if you get a, a notification from a sensor or, or whatever zillions of ways that they have of, of the if on that, um, the if on that sort of that equation, um, if this, then run a few things. It's because IFTTT sits in the cloud. It's not in your home network and you're, you're waiting, you're number one, you're waiting additional time for home automation things to fire because you're waiting for a cloud-based service to fire them, to fire those things off. And if it's doing it in sequence, then it potentially creates additional problems because what if one of those things doesn't work? How long does it wait to time out? And just so on and so on. I could go on that topic for a whole show probably, but we don't have time for that. Now, let me tell you what I'm used to, and this is why that I use some of these modern home automation systems but not in the same way that some people are using them today because I'm used to the old fashioned way. And when I talk about old fashioned, I kind of mean really old fashioned. Take a look at this thing. This is the JDS Time Commander. This is a 20 year old, 20 plus year old device. Look, it's got a RS-232 port and, and uh, RJ-11 jacks on the back of it. If you can, uh, if it'll uh, let's, uh, let it focus in on that. Um, just completely crazy, right? Um, but this was home automation years ago. I guess some people still have these and actually use it, but this is really an X10 controller and automator. And you had, you know, for extended functionality, you had to keep it connected to your computer. And I found out ways in 1998 to connect that thing to a website with password protection options. And I could get feedback from my home automation system. I did all that myself. So I'm used to things with physical hubs and controllers and central command of things, um, things that are always on and always connected. I'm not used to the modern way, which everyone wants to control everything with their phone. Some people like having a hub, some people don't. Um, and there's, there's a way that works for everyone in general. The challenge is it's also new that we're waiting on companies to get it right because the challenge is the old way and even the way that I do things, you know, sitting on that Mac back there, I've talked about it before and I'll have some episodes coming up. Indigo is server software, I've talked about it before. It allows me to really dial things in, write some code um, to program uh, the logic behind the home automation uh, that I have here and that's how I have the Nest connected up to it, Hue lights, geolocation, and a number of other things. And it's all done because I've customized it myself, but I am not most people. I am not you, even the people who um, watch this channel, not all of you are coders, not all of you are extreme techies who are ready to just dive in. You, you, you've gotten into this, you're really curious about it, you found the channel, you wanna do a few things, but you're not ready to start writing Perl scripts. You're not start, that, that was old days. You're not ready to, to start writing Python scripts and things like that. Um, you just wanna have it work. So we have to wait a little bit longer for devices like the Google Home, which has a lot of promise, right? This is, it's Google. Google's got the treasure trove of deep learning knowledge. So beyond just your smarter home devices, it's got the capability of running a number of things for you and being your real personal assistant. Amazon has been catching up in that regard and doing a pretty good job, but we knew that Google would jump into the fray. Whether Apple's gonna do it or not, we don't know. Whether Samsung will do it um, with the new Viv's uh, AI system that they just bought, uh, that was created by the original founders of Siri. Uh, we don't know what they're gonna come out with. Maybe they'll come out with their own smart speaker. Obviously they own smart things. Uh, so 
look for some interesting developments on, on that uh, with smart things Samsung and Viv uh, next year. Obviously Siri's got you know Siri's in the Apple world and that's kind of locked down um, and Cortana on Windows but no one, I really hear almost nothing about Cortana and home automation even though they do kind of have a, a little bit of a marketing deal with Insteon. So now you're gonna say well you've talked about all that well what's the solution to just keep waiting? Well not necessarily. Okay, so one of the other questions was about Echo devices, right? And, and it will come up with the Google Home. Is that I bought this thing and I have some Hue lights and I have a Nest and I have a couple of other things connected to it. Not hubs, not controllers, but just things, okay? Um, Wi-Fi light bulbs, Wi-Fi on-off switches, you know, what have you. But this, like I said, this is not a home automation controller, it's an assistant, which is why it's doing things one at a time. So how do you get past that? How do you make this thing smarter? Uh, really, it's not, it's not the physical object, it's the cloud, it's, it's the entire uh, Alexa um, system that's, uh, that's running in Amazon, uh, the Amazon cloud. You connect it to something like Yanomi or a, a new app that's making uh, the rounds and making the waves, which I have not tried yet, uh, Stringify. Uh, you know me, which I reviewed and I talked to the CEO, I had a wonderful conversation uh, with him, um, uh, Kent, uh, Kent Dixon, uh, back in uh, early September. Um, you know me is a free home automation app that is cross-platform, Android and iOS. It's free. Did I say free? It's free. It's twice as free. It's free. Okay. Um, <laughs> zero barrier to entry. You can create triggers, you can create timed events, and you can create a whole bunch of actions to happen also based on a voice command from your Alexa-enabled device. Um, so that extends the functionality and it gives you that ability um, that IFTTT doesn't give you because you get to do many things based on something happening and you get to extend the functionality of your Amazon Echo device and probably Google Home as well um, and you get to do it with an app that's running on your smartphone or tablet, whichever um, major uh, platform that you happen to be on. So the modern way of doing things is that you have this enormous ecosystem that's out there, uh, or I should say ecosystems, that each of them kind of want you to be locked into their little world. Some of them are more open than others. We know that HomeKit is kind of closed off, but HomeKit's closed off because Apple's really, really, really has to double down on security and privacy. So they require physical certain chipsets to be in HomeKit certified products. That's why we've only started to finally see a ton of HomeKit products out there um, just now because Everything that was in existence before HomeKit had to be upgraded or replaced or had an, uh, a hub added on to the, added onto their system to make it compatible. Uh, or brand new products had to be introduced. We've pretty much seen that everywhere. It's also why we don't still see an individual separate um, LED smart bulb that has HomeKit in it that doesn't require a hub. So one day we will. I'm, I'm really betting that it's going to be early next year. Probably the first one will be LifeX or someone else will just come out of the gate that we've never even heard of. Uh, and when, when we hear about it, we'll, uh, we'll let you know because we've got contacts with a number of different companies now um, to, um, to kind of get the, uh, the pulse of what's going on. So, uh, so that's the, the HomeKit side is, is, is one thing. Um, Apple's done a, a good job of, of making it that you can add uh, you can control directly from your phone, which is which is great with no other software required except the uh, the maker's uh, app. And I'm not saying that HomeKit's the best one. I'm not saying that say um, a Smart Things or a Wink or something else is the best thing. But to do real, and I say this real home automation, you really need something that's a little bit more powerful than HomeKit. It's a little bit more powerful than one of these um, assistant devices. Um, you need something like an actual system, and that's like starting with a hub, like a smart things, a wink. Um, there's so many of them out there that uh, I have not actually reviewed or personally used. Sorry about that. More about that coming later in that special little segment about supporting the show. Um, but it it this stuff 
also depends highly on what platform that you want to stay on. You may be in the Samsung world and want to stay with the Samsung smartphones and so forth and, and tablets and whatnot. It makes sense to kind of stay within that world. Uh, if you're on the, in the Google and Android world, you may want to stay in Google Home and, and grow with it. Um, these are questions that are part of if this uh, if you've watched the beginning of the uh, Getting Started with Home Automation series that I began and, and need to desperately need to continue. There will be episodes of that coming out this month. We'll hope to finish that series out by the end of the year. Um, number one question, remember, is what do you want to do with it? Because that's going to determine so many other things beyond budget, beyond, um, well, to a certain extent, it's going to determine, you know, uh, your, your platform that you're already on is going to play into that. But you really have to decide what do you want to do with it now, maybe a year from now, two years from now, make your plan. So those episodes are coming out. They're going to be really valuable, and I'm going to dive right into those topics. So that'll be helpful. So what I'm telling you at this point is if you don't want to buy a hub, then try out one of these free controller apps. If you have an Echo, if you have a, um, not yet with Google Home, we're looking at mid to late December when Google opens up the uh, SDK so that developers can get in and start writing um, and creating uh, custom actions and so forth for the Google Assistant, which is what powers the Google Home device and, and also um, the Assistant on, on other things within the Google uh, system or within Google devices like the Pixel. Um, we have to wait a little bit of that uh, of time for that. But remember that the Google Home can talk to IFTTT. It can talk to SmartThings, which is an actual hub. Obviously, it can talk to Nest, and it can talk to Hue Lights. With those four, that's actually a pretty decent way to get started. But to create the automation side, you're really going to have to tie it back to something like a SmartThings uh, or an IFTTT, which would do things one at a time. So. If you're buying these devices, these assistant devices, and you're really frustrated, then I encourage you to try something like you know me um, and, and link it up to it. Um, I encourage you to potentially, if you're really, if you can't wait, because <laughs> other things are going to start popping up in the Google ecosystem um, for the assistant starting probably late December, early January, and I'm sure there will be some other announcements at CES, which we'll be covering in, uh, in January for you. Um, if you can't wait then you, and you really want to do home automation, then you may have to link up the Google Home to a SmartThings Hub to really get those automations to work um, the way you want them to. Because on, on, on a hub, you can define a bunch of actions to happen, and then you can fire that off with a command from the Google Home. But the Google Home itself is still going to need separate commands, at least for now, to do things like this because uh, the Google Home can control Chromecast devices, the SmartThings Hub cannot. So, again, we're waiting for all these integrations to happen and for Google and Amazon to get their act together and actually make these devices control um, multiple things in a row um, instead of having to issue one command and the next command and the next command, which is kind of stupid. <laughs> the next piece of this um, is going to get linked up through, um, there's a link on the screen most likely, one of those cards that YouTube ha is, is having us use instead of annotations. There's a link in the video description for this next piece that I would like you to take a look at about supporting Smarter Home Life. Like I said, now more important than ever. Um, and uh, take a look at that. It's not a published video. It's not public. It's only tied to this, um, just as sort of a little bit of an experiment. You're the core audience. You're um, viewing this video because you want the information, and you're the core. You're the audience I'm really speaking to, not necessarily the audience that watches the five or six or seven minute videos on product reviews, uh, who are just here and there, and maybe maybe they come back, maybe they don't. Um, you are watching this with the core audience, and I hope that you've made it all the way through the end of this episode. As always.